like to welcome you to our community housing forum, our second community housing forum. I'm Carla Froney, and I'm the Falmouth Housing Coordinator. Uh, tonight, this is our second community forum to talk about the Housing Production Plan, and uh, we're interested in hearing your comments tonight. We have a draft plan that has been created, and that's what will be presented to you this evening. The plan will cover how the town is going to uh, develop affordable housing for the next five years. Our meeting tonight is jointly sponsored by the Planning Board and the Affordable Housing Committee. The Affordable Housing Committee um, has been instrumental in obtaining funding um, and supporting the development of the housing production plan. Uh, I'd like to introduce the new chair of the committee, Ed Curley. Ed, uh, would you please uh, stand up and introduce your committee members who I will also ask to stand, please. Thank you, Carla. Uh, as Carla said, I'm new uh, chairperson of the committee. Um, been about six years a member, and I thought I'd just start by reading you only two sentences, the uh, mission statement of the Affordable Housing Committee. Some of you may not be as familiar with it as others are. The Affordable Housing Committee assists the Board of Selectmen in its efforts to provide a full range of housing choices for households of all incomes and ages. The committee works to identify our workforce housing needs, to reduce the out-migration of our younger residents, and to minimize the displacement of our elderly on fixed incomes. And uh, there are six of us on the committee now. Uh, the longest tenured member, and uh, uh, the former chair and the heart and soul of ho affordable housing is Holly Wilson. Uh, why don't we ask this committee to stand now, just so it, it can be seen. Uh, Pamela Harding Barrett is uh, also on the committee and on the planning board, so she'll get introduced twice. <coughs> Uh, Rini Brune is on our committee, uh, got sick this past week and is unable to attend tonight. Joe LeMay is in the back because he's going to another meeting as soon as I introduce him here at this meeting. Um, and our newest member, Jessica O'Brien, was appointed by the uh, planning board last night. Excellent. So welcome, Great. Jessica. Thanks to all the Affordable Housing Committee members. And I'll turn it over to Jim. Good evening. Thanks for having us. I'm Jim Fox. I'm Presently, the chairman of the planning board with us tonight is Pam Harding Bryant, B Barrett, excuse me, Paul Dwyer, Pat Kerfoot, John Drooley, and Bob Leary. Um, that's about it. So, do I meet the town planner, Tom Fox? I'm here tonight. Thanks, Jim. I'd also like to make mention of the fact we have a couple of our uh, board of selectmen here this evening. We have uh, Sue Moran in the back there, uh, Sam Patterson, and Doug Brown. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, our assistant town manager, Peter Johnson Staub. Peter has been instrumental in guiding uh, me in my new job here and in moving forward the update to our housing production plan. So Peter, thank you. All right, so let's get our program underway now. Uh, we'll be having a presentation of our draft housing production plan uh, by our consultant, Karen Sunnerberg. Karen will be presenting some background information about the plan and uh, also the results of her research and analysis She'll talk about affordable housing needs in town. And at the end of her presentation, she'll also be uh, taking comments. And we're very interested in having your comments when you get uh, a chance to speak. We're going to ask that you use a microphone. There's a microphone standing in the aisle way, in the center aisle. And we also have some roving microphones which uh, Peter Johnson-Staub uh, will be uh, bringing to you 
when needed. So uh, let me now introduce Karen Sonnerberg. Come on up, Karen. All right. Can everybody hear me? Great, it's all working. Uh, thanks, Carla, and thanks to the Affordable Housing Committee and the Planning Board for sponsoring this evening, and to all of you who uh, took valuable time um, from your own uh, schedules to be here and participate. Um, this is, I'm gonna go through kind of the highlights of the plan. It's a fairly comprehensive uh, and detailed uh, document. I'm gonna ask you to you know, be patient and hold off on any questions and comments till I get through it so we make sure that we have ample time for uh, discussion. Uh, as Carla mentioned, this is the second community housing forum that we held. The first one was in July 12th. Uh, for that forum, we focused on the first major component of the plan, uh, the housing needs assessment, and went through a host of information on demographic, economic, housing characteristics, and trends. Um, we then broke up into groups to weigh in on what the town's housing priorities and key housing strategies should be to better promote uh, affordable housing. Um, tonight, the first part of the presentation is kind of a, a quick glimpse at some of the information that we already included on the housing needs assessment. What I really wanna focus on are the housing strategies. Uh, so with that, we're gonna move forward to talk a little bit about the purpose of the housing production plan. Um, one, obtain updated information on demographic, economic, and housing characteristics and trends through the housing needs assessment, better understand the current housing market dynamic, document priority housing needs, and identify particular strategies to address those needs and production goals. Uh, provide guidance to strategically invest local resources to leverage them to the greatest extent possible, and to create a roadmap for getting closer to the state's 10% affordability goal. Should mention though, based on what we've documented in the housing needs assessment, once the town reaches the 10% affordability goal, guess what? There'll still be unmet housing needs in the community. Um, and the other purpose is really to uh, try to strive for housing production plan certification. And we'll talk about this in the next slide. So we are um, preparing this plan based on state housing production plan regulations and guidelines. These guidelines are actually a subset of the Chapter 40B regulations that were meant to give greater local control over housing to communities. Um, the first step of the uh, process is to get plan approval. So not only are local approvals to the planning board and board of selectmen essential, but approval from the state's Department of Housing and Community Development is also required, and the plan has to meet a number of very prescribed uh, uh, requirements in um, these housing plan housing production plan requirements. Um, the plan must include production goals equivalent to a half of 1% of the town's year-round housing stock. And for Falmouth, that figure is 74 units. If the town can document that it's actually produced those 74 units at any calendar year, it becomes what's called certified and some people call this a safe harbor. It's where the town is protected against what it might consider inappropriate Chapter 40B comprehensive permit applications um, where the developer can submit an application to override local zoning. The town still processes the application, but the developer cannot deny the decision um, to the state. If the town produces 1% of its year-round housing stock and that 
would be 149 units in the case of Falmouth, it gets a two-year uh, safe harbor certification um, through housing production plan. Um, and it's worth noting that in 2009, Falmouth actually received such certification um, from the state. So wanted also just to do another kind of quick overview of what is affordable housing. And there are various definitions. For example, HUD basically says, if a household is spending more than 30% of its income on housing costs, whether it's for rental or home ownership, they're living in unaffordable housing. Uh, they're discussed as being cost burdened with uh, affordability uh, problems. Um, the definition that we most typically use is that, once again, that goes back to Chapter 40B. In order for a unit to be counted towards that 10% affordability threshold under 40B, um, or through these annual housing production goals, it has to meet a number of very specific requirements. We call these units the capital A affordable housing units. Uh, they've got to be permanent and either directly subsidized by a state or local government um, or a federal government or approved by a subsidizing agency. For example, a 40B project has to go through a subsidizing agency and given the go ahead before the developer can submit uh, an application to the Zoning Board of Appeals. The units have to be deed restricted and we're moving more and more towards in perpetuity. Um, the units have to be affirmatively marketed so that those outside the community have an opportunity to learn about uh, the affordable housing units that uh, are available. Um, nevertheless, in most projects, up to 70% of the units can be uh, reserved for those who would live or work in the community referred to as local preference units. Um, the units have to be affordable to households earning at or below 80% of area median income, and we're talking about the whole Barnstable County uh, area. Now, just to give you an example, for uh, a three-person household, that's the equivalent of $62,100. For a one-person household, it's uh, $48,300. And these limits are adjusted annually by HUD. I should also mention that units that don't meet all these requirements, but still serve a pressing local housing need or sometimes what we refer to as the little a affordable units, and we have included those in this plan uh, as well. So what housing is affordable in Falmouth? Um, the town, this is based on 2010 census figures, has 14,870 year-round units, of which currently 959 um, are considered affordable by the state, those capital A affordable units, it's the equivalent of 6.45%. However, the town has another 305 units that should be eligible for inclusion, inclusion in the SHI, which is, it is busily working with the state to get counted. And that will bring the town up to 8.5%, which is, uh, you know, pretty, pretty good and showing some significant uh, progress. Um, nevertheless, the number of affordable housing units needed will increase over time because when that 2020 census is released, probably in like late 2021, that year-round housing total will reflect growth and therefore increase, therefore the 10% affordability threshold will increase and the uh, annual housing production goal uh, will increase as well, probably going from 74 to about 76 uh, units. The housing plan includes a number of uh, housing needs indicators, um, and uh, I'm not, it, 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 it's pretty detailed uh, in um, sections of the uh, plan. We did make some, um, identify priority housing needs and some goals. Um, we have concluded 
based on the indicators of need that rental units are the top need to offer more affordable housing choices, the goal of 85% of the affordable units produced. And some of the rationale behind this is that uh, the town needs permanent year-round housing for its most vulnerable residents and workforce. Rental housing is uh, based on uh, you know, accessibility more affordable typically. It'll help diversify the housing stock as 86% of the units are single family homes, detached homes in, um, in Selmas and about 78% are uh, owner occupied. Uh, it'll provide greater opportunities to build at some larger scale and leverage other sources of financing as almost all state and federal housing subsidy funds are directed to uh, rental housing. And based on how uh, various uh, layers of subsidy can be put together, you can finance a larger developments. And actually, developments around 40 units become kind of the sweet spot for uh, competing for these, uh, very, these limited housing resources. Uh, rental housing will also help meet the 10% affordability goal and annual housing production goals faster as all rental units in a Chapter 40 redevelopment count towards the SHI, even if only 25%, the minimum required, are actually affordable. Um, rental units provide more appropriately sized units for increasing numbers of smaller households offer opportunities for mixed income housing with several income tiers, including those earning at very low or extremely low income levels who have the greatest cost burdens. And just to give you an example, there are about 660 rental households in town earning at or below 50% of area median income, which is in the $30,000 range, who are spending more than half their income on housing. These, these folks are, are, should be the targets for uh, new housing opportunities that are affordable. And rental housing will benefit greater numbers of households over time as rental uh, turn over uh, more regularly than ownership units. We nevertheless did not exclude home ownership because we realize that home ownership is, is also very important um, to the community. <coughs> the goal of 15% of the affordable units produced. Um, home ownership, affordable ownership, typically offers smaller scale development and infill housing opportunities in existing neighborhoods, typically financed almost exclusively with local funding if Chapter 40B um, isn't used. It uh, provides first time home ownership families who are shut out of the housing market and would otherwise be unable to afford to live in Falmouth provide more housing options for empty nesters looking for uh, other housing opportunities to downsize and to better meet their current lifestyle, and to lend additional stability to neighborhoods as owners, not always, but um, often tend to become more rooted and invested in the community. And we also identified a real need to focus on those um, people with disabilities with special needs and suggest that housing efforts uh, integrate handicapped accessibility and or supportive services into new development with a goal of uh, t uh, providing, having those provisions in at least 20% of new units produced for seniors or single individuals and at least 10% for those uh, units directed to families. 14.2% um, of all residents claimed a disability in Falmouth compared to 11.6% uh, level statewide. And those, that level need will increase as the population continues to age over the next couple of decades. Um, limited handicapped, uh, handicapped accessible units and existing subsidized housing also indicates a, a, a real need for more such opportunities. Um, the state does recognize that, you know, producing affordable housing is complicated. It takes time 
uh, persistence, lots of patience, not a slam dunk. And as, that, as, as so, it requires as part of producing a housing production plan that you include a section that really shows what the constraints are in the community for producing affordable housing and potential ways to mitigate uh, those challenges. Uh, so we have included or uh, highlighted these particular uh, challenges in the plan. Uh, a big one, which is local infrastructure with hardly, you know, very limited sewer services. Um, the uh, town is uh, challenged to meet DEP requirements, uh, denitrification um, uh, re requirements, and uh, meet those that have uh, that involve the flow neutral bylaw, uh, all kind of providing some constraints uh, to new development. Uh, zoning, uh, you also go into some detail about certain measures uh, that the town has put in place in its uh, zoning bylaw to hopefully create affordable housing and smart growth development, and most which have not been particularly effective. So, um, uh, I mean, and there are examples that we cite in the, um, in, in the housing plan. Uh, clearly, for communities on the Cape, environmental concerns are uh, uh, very real and important, and the town has invested uh, considerable uh, energy and resources into uh, preserving, protecting um, its, uh, its environment, and there's always a balance between Envi you know, protect the environment and also other public be benefits um, that uh, need to be, um, the town needs to be concerned about including affordable housing. Um, property costs and availability is also another issue. There is more limited land available uh, for development. There are fewer and fewer parcels that uh, are available that don't involve already existing restrictions or come with considerable uh, development constraints. Um, high cost of land and homes that are, have largely been driven by higher income retirees and second homeowners and uh, a, a seasonal uh, economy. Um, an example is the median single family house uh, is valued at $400,000, which requires an income of over $82,000 to afford. Um, while the median income, household income, of existing uh, year-round residents is $68,440. Another example is the median rent of $1,129, and this is from census estimates, which typically undercount actual market prices. But even at the 1129 rental, you would need an income of over $52,000 and the median income of renter households in Falmouth is $36,000. So you see the affordability gaps right there. Um, availability of subsidy funds, Falmouth is fortunate to have the Community Preservation Act and it has established uh, the Falmouth Affordable Housing Fund to help um, subsidize support affordable housing uh, development, but those funds are limited. <laughs> And there are state and federal and regional resources that the town can tap into, but these are also limited and extremely competitive. Uh, community uh, perception is also a challenge in almost every community. The whole not in my backyard exists um, in, um, in Falmouth as elsewhere. Um, and uh, there was also participants in the July 12th uh, Community Forum also questioned whether, you know, what was the political will locally, regionally, and statewide with respect to really promoting uh, affordable housing. And what comes up over and over again is the limited public transportation and uh, maintain, owning, maintaining a car can be an expensive uh, venture and really does further constrain uh, the pocketbooks of those more vulnerable uh, residents in the community. Finally, on housing strategies, um, I wanted to kind of go through, not only to kind of list where these all came from, 
but also kind of to thank the people who have participated in the process. Um, all the strategies that are included in this, um, this draft plan um, came from a number of sources. Uh, one was previous plans and studies, including the 2009 uh, housing production plan, as well as a 2014 housing um, demand study with this uh, 2017 update. Plus the town has been involved in other uh, planning studies and reports, which really did provide significant uh, input into what we're proposing. Uh, the, I, I think the input that we received in the, in the July 12th community housing workshop can't be uh, overstated. Um, those who participated, you'll hear uh, what you came up with uh, as part of the package that we're proposing. Uh, stakeholder interviews, uh, the Affordable Housing Committee identified uh, a whole range of people who um, have a real stake interest in the uh, uh, promoting affordable housing in the community and regionally. And so um, um, I met with uh, numerous uh, folks. Uh, also, uh, Carla uh, was involved in those interviews too, which were really, really helpful. Uh, production goals, you know, 74 units per year. How are we gonna get to that? We have to kind of show uh, through strategies how we expect uh, to come up with uh, those units per year. Uh, effective strategies from other comparable communities, and I should mention Falmouth too. You know, what's been working here, we have tried to really identify and say continue doing this. Or, you know, there's some strategies that are suggesting to tweak a little bit. But for the most part, you'll see when you read the document that we have provided models of how certain strategies have been effectively implemented in other communities. And in some cases, providing some photos as well. Um, and the housing needs assessment, what we came up with as priority housing needs, uh, indicators of need certainly informed the mix of strategies. I should add that these strategies involve a package. Each one has to go through its normal regulatory or other appropriate channels in order to uh, be approved and implemented. Um, the package, the town will have to um, uh, prioritize, and we have identified responsible entities and an approximate uh, time frame um, for implementation. So the first category of strategies uh, involves building local capacity. Um, and first and probably foremost, you know, uh, was a kind of a you know clear message in the first uh, housing workshop how important it is to uh, have a, an inclusive and transparent outreach process on any housing initiative so people can really weigh in on what the town is proposing. Um, and also to learn about, you know, there's always some, you know, myths and misinformation going on in any community about, about affordable housing. Uh, so it's really important to get out the right information, the correct, reliable information, uh, and share that. Uh, the Cape Community Housing Partnership, which has uh, uh, been evolving with support from the Massachusetts Housing Partnership, uh, Housing Assistance Corporation and Community Development Partnership, I think also provides some uh, additional um, avenues for education and um, advocacy. Um, Another strategy is to provide additional support for the Falmouth Affordable Housing Fund. Uh, we suggest that the town consider a model that most communities are now using to create affordable housing trust funds um, under state enabling uh, legislation that would add some additional layers of power to the existing um, housing um, fund. Uh, something to consider, um, and to secure additional resources to capitalize the fund. And we, um, we provide some examples of how the town might um, better tap into a, a new and existing resources to provide more funding, to leverage more uh, resources to support its uh, housing agenda. And also to formalize the monitoring 
of the terms and conditions assorted, uh, associated with those capital A affordable uh, units included in the subsidized housing inventory. Uh, one is to create a database on each project with detailed information on you know, describing the project and having all the documents related to the affordability terms and conditions um, in hard and digital contact, uh, copies so that they're, relative, they're, they're, they're accessible right away. Um, and knowledge is power. Um, and to enforce the affordability requirements, there have been issues I know with um, uh, some of the deed writers that were prepared incorrectly and there are some monitoring agents that are tearing their hair out about those. Um, but there have also been some units that have been lost and might have been um, retrieved with some um, a greater effort so we offer some suggestions about uh, better enforcing and maintaining, preserving uh, the SHI units. Um, consider introducing annual monitoring fees. There are a number of monitoring agents um, uh, locally. When monitoring agents are brought on, they get an initial fee uh, for doing the monitoring work, but there's nothing that comes afterwards. Because preserving the existing affordable housing inventory is so important. I mean, a lot of work goes into creating these units. You really want to make the effort of preserving them. And annual monitoring of each unit project is really important. Um, I, I, you know, uh, the town wouldn't have to spend an exorbitant amount of money to do this, but it should consider actually providing some fees, annual fees to monitors, to make sure this important work is done and to really monitor the monitors. Um, preserve expiring use units. We identify in the plan that there are projects where the affordability restrictions are due to expire some in a sooner, some you know, relatively into the future, um, and we provide some guidance on how to uh, preserve those. Um, consider establishing a regional monitoring entity. I know that this has been at least briefly discussed by the Cape Y Community Housing Partnership, but there are models that have been really effective in Metro West area and the North Suburban area of Boston, for example, through what's called a, the Regional Housing Services Office, where communities can, can buy into a certain menu of services. And mo a, a good, you know, a, a major part of this menu is monitoring services. So there might be some real rationale in exploring how you might kind of better regionalize, not Cape wide, maybe in the Upper Cape. Uh, and then um, hold mortgages on affordable units, uh, the ones the town actually provides some financing in addition to the affordable housing restriction. It's been suggested the town consider adding another a layer of uh, safety in preserving the affordability restrictions through actual mortgages. Um, also through the July 12th workshop, it was suggested that the planning board prepare a land use growth map um, to gu you know, guide uh, future growth um, to appropriate locations. On to zoning. Um, I mean, zoning is such a powerful tool, particularly for communities that don't have um, lots of funding to subsidize units, from providing mandates, incentives for uh, the town's pursuit of public benefits, including affordable housing zoning, is uh, a very important tool. Uh, one is to modify the accessory dwelling unit bylaw, and I was over here in prior to this meeting that the planning board was talking about um, changes in the existing bylaw to make it more effective. Um, encourage a multifamily and mixed use development. The town has been you know, involved in various studies, looking at opportunities to promote um, denser and mixed use development in particular locations. Um, David Strait's uh, study is an example. There are numbers of options that towns have available to um, actually promote uh, 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 mixed use and multifamily housing. Um, one is to create a Chapter 40R Smart Growth Overlay District. Um, the 
Uh, this involves, you know, finding a location where some much denser development makes sense to create a bylaw with design guidelines, um, working with the state um, and approved locally where development within that zoning would be by right, have to include at least 20% of the units as affordable. And one of the you know, reasons for uh, doing this, um, besides trying to direct zoning to appropriate places, is that the state provides a couple uh, different sources of financing to make development uh, feasible and to incorporate uh, affordability um, through um, a number of different um, payments. Um, allow residential uses in the Falmouth Mall areas come up a number of times and we provide some examples on how that has been uh, implemented in other uh, communities to create a village center zoning uh, through special overlay district uh, and once again we provide some examples of other communities that are uh, that have done this type of zoning and the use of the friendly 40b process um, 40b can be a great permitting tool um, even communities that have gone beyond the 10% affordability threshold are still using 40B for permitting in a lot of cases um, because it, uh, it, it really makes sense uh, based on their unmet needs and the uh, relatively you know, greater ease, supposedly, of uh, permitting. Um, and, you know, uh, promoting above the shop uh, units um, should also, you know, should be a, a, a consideration that right now they're not even allowed in the um, Falmouth's business districts. So, you know, this was something that we heard over and over again that this was an, a, should be a priority uh, for the town. And allow more diverse housing types in more areas. Um, there are housing types that um, the town should consider allowing because they address a wider range of particular housing needs that either aren't allowed right now or are severely constrained. And we include a list of, of housing types that might be considered. And this relates to this missing middle concept where there are opportunities to provide infill housing in existing neighborhoods that um, still resonate with the character of the community they provide some smaller um, and greater numbers of housing units in, in neighborhoods. And the town has been working on this missing middle uh, concept, uh, has been working with the um, uh, Union Studios design firm on kind of showing visual representations of what various types of housing and levels of density um, for the town to consider in adjusting uh, zoning. And expand inclusionary zoning. Town has a very limited inclusionary uh, zoning component as part of this bond. Inclusionary zoning that there are incentives or mandates for including affordable housing as part of new development. Um, this strategy suggests that the town look at a town-wide inclusionary zoning bylaw so that as development goes forward, a certain percentage of the new development includes some affordable housing or some payments in lieu of that housing that can be deposited uh, to help capitalize the housing trust uh, fund. Um, and explore tax relief for year-round rentals. This has been adopted in Provincetown and Wellfleet um, as a way of providing additional incentive for year-round rentals as part of the private housing stock. On to actual production strategies. Uh, this is like soundly based in partnerships. Um, first is to uh, make suitable public property available for affordable housing. And Falmouth has a tradition of doing this. Uh, example is the Odd Fellows Hall, uh, Spring Bars Road, and uh, the St. Ma uh, Mark's uh, Road projects. Um, and uh, by identifying parcels, it would we suggest start with those that are included in the 2009 housing production plan that have not yet been developed and look into the feasibility of, uh, of including
including uh, those in an RFP process where the town really um, has control over the terms and conditions uh, of the development that will, and, and choose a developer that has the capacity uh, to actually um, pull it off uh, in partnership with the town. Uh, probably through a, um, uh, and then uh, the, um, there's an idea of like to further uh, potential additional properties that have come up um, that should be uh, reviewed. Uh, further site acquisition, the town actually acquired the Spring Bars Road property and you know did the whole RFP process and working now with the Thelma uh, Housing Corporation and affirmative investments. Um, another consideration. Pro also, with more resources in its uh, affordable housing fund, the town will be in a better position to actually do some more acquisition, potentially even bonding CPA funding. Um, and use of new state resources, we outline a number of new housing initiatives that have been um, introduced by the state for consideration to support uh, local affordable housing efforts, so including the Workforce Housing Fund, the Community Scale Housing Initiative, which is actually two projects in Thelmet, um, uh, there are two proposals, applications for the type of, uh, of funding um, to uh, support some uh, local affordable housing. And the Starter Home Program is another one that we, we talk about. Um, promote partnership with developers, and I should also add potentially partnerships with service providers as well when we're talking about special needs housing. Um, and those partnerships can involve from existing zoning or the proposed zoning that's part of this housing production plan, uh, the friendly 40B process, too, where the town and the developer basically agree on the terms and conditions of a particular uh, development project and uh, work with the state in order to uh, kind of uh, move uh, a comprehensive permit uh, project forward. Uh, we should also mention the plan lists types of preferred properties and locations of properties where a friendly 40B development would be uh, um, entertained. Uh, financing, the town can be really helpful by providing some subsidy funds to support the feasibility of the new affordable units that are created as part of any uh, development town can be very helpful in providing advocacy, particularly during the permitting process, to, um, and in dealing with the neighborhood, the existing neighborhood where the, in which the project is proposed to help um, actually uh, kind of support uh, the project moving forward. And we also list some other incentives that the town might consider in order to better to promote these partnerships on private development that include affordable housing, including expedited permitting, fee waivers, density bonuses, allocating sewer capacity like it's done with Spring Bars Road, and tax subsidies. Those are just some examples. Um, and back again to encouraging special needs housing um, as one of those uh, housing priorities that we identified early for the town supporting financing and help to market and fill vacancies. What we discovered through um, our kind of research is that some of the um, handicapped accessible units and subsidy developments, they haven't been able to find people with disabilities to fill them. So we propose some real kind of uh, collaboration between this town's Commission on Disabilities and Affordable Housing Committee and uh, sponsors of affordable housing like the Housing Authority to really work together to advertise um, opportunities to get a list of people who would be interested and to really make sure that people who need those units um, know about them and can access them. And explore regional partnerships. The CAPE has many examples of uh, precedents for regionalism and we offer a few for uh, consideration in the plan. Next steps, um, you know, based on comments, we're gonna finalize the plan, fully compile it, um, and we need planning board and board of selectmen approvals before we can submit it to the state. The state uh, technically has 
90 days to review it. And a couple years ago, you could almost count the 90 days by when that letter was going to come out. But I got to say, they're moving much more quickly. And so we're now looking at four to six weeks review par, um, period by the state, which has been terrific. Um, and, you know, then it's, then it's the big challenge of, you know, of implementation. And we will be putting um, the uh, documents uh, on the town's website for people to, um, to review it in more detail beyond uh, you know, my cursory uh, review. So with that, we're going to just open up to questions. Yeah, so you have to have yeah, we have a uh, we have a microphone in the center aisle, and also Peter Johnson Staub has a roving mic, but uh, and Tom Bach. Before though, we take comments, and I'm sorry to interrupt you, Michael, but um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that there are members here tonight of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Oh, good. We have three members here tonight. We have the chairman. Four. Four. Four and an alternate. Um, TJ Hurry. Stand up. Stand up. Yeah. And I'm going to give you this microphone. My name is TJ Hurry. I'm the chairman of the Zoning Board of Appeals. And with me tonight is the vice chairman, Ken Foreman. Ed Van Curen, Jerry Patamas, and Bob Dugan. Correct. Thank you, TJ. Now, Michael, thank you thank, for Thanks, your Carla. Uh, and first, wanna, you guys have done a great job. Really appreciate all the work that's got, gone into this. It's been a long time coming. Um, a couple quick questions. Uh, I haven't had a chance to read through your, your draft, but I did notice something on page 13 that got my attention, which says that if we uh, include units between 80 and 100 percent in a rental project that those units wouldn't count. Is that the case? I always thought that in a rental project, all the units count. It, uh, th th it means those units would count like it means like all it's the same. Uh, it's the uh, all the units would count. Yes. Okay, as, long so as, as long as it met all the other Chapter 40B requirements for inclusion, so at least 25 percent of the units would have to be affordable to those earning at or below 80% of area median. Okay, so you have to meet that 40B requirement yeah. first, have 25% of the units. That's right. Then if you have units higher um, than at 80%, like 80 to 100, that's, that's all those right. units would, would count in a yes. 40B project. Just as market units would count. Yes, right, yeah. just wanted to make sure. Um, I was wondering, uh, we have a very strong demand here for seasonal housing for people that come and work in our community. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael's here from the uh, Chamber of Commerce and he'll mm -hmm. tell you that his mm -hmm. businesses really need mm -hmm. seasonal housing. Mm -hmm. Have you taken a look at that and what the demand might be for that well, and how we might be able to meet that? Yeah, you know, what we um, suggest is that there may be need to do a more regional approach where the communities are all pitching in to come up with, um, with, uh, with resources to support um, seasonal units. The, um, the other thing is that that could be, it should probably, it's a good thing to add to those other types of housing. I'm trying to remember if we included it. Um, but other types of housing that can be allowed kind of need zoning um, to, I think we did take it up in, in the other types of housing stock when we talk about in a dorm tile style housing mm -hmm. or conversions of larger units into smaller units and provide example of some zoning language that Dennis is considering. So I think we tried to take it up in that uh, other types of housing, but also mentioned uh, it as part of a kind of potential regional uh, okay. approach too. I think it's important that we address yeah. that. One of the issues that yeah. we have is that if we use any state uh, funding to build a uh, seasonal workforce housing program, that were restricted that all the tenants have to sign year leases and as we know a lot of our seasonal workers are here less than a year some are only here for a few months so that's been an issue and we have talked to the yeah. state about that so well none of those units could be counted as affordable or part of the subsidized housing inventory but once again they still have a pressing local need so right. it'd be part of that little a okay, two, two other quick questions if i couldn't and this one 
is more towards the planning board. I was wondering if they could give us an update since uh, increasing density is so important, so critical, if the planning board, uh, maybe the chairman can give us an update on where they're at on trying to increase density in some of our neighborhoods. Uh, then another quick question that I have is maybe someone from the selectmen, since this is another important issue, could tell us where they're at on increasing the sewer capacity and the distribution of sewer in our community. And lastly, just as a comment, uh, this is a great presentation. I'm wondering maybe in an abbreviated format that this could be presented to town meeting uh, at the upcoming town meeting and also maybe have drafted this because somewhere along the line we're going to need their their help and their approvals, whether it's to change zoning, but I think just doing an educational process at this upcoming town meeting would be helpful. So those are my, my questions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, does anybody from the planning board or the board of select want to address those questions? Do you want to talk later or what? Yeah. Sure, okay. So on behalf of the board of selectmen, I can tell you in terms of sewer capacity, the board has stated um, essentially a mandate for um, the town staff to come up with a plan so that um, when we approve projects, we've already had the, um, the water supervisor tell us how much capacity we have. We know we're getting um, to the end of that, and so we've asked right now for a plan to be put together for next steps so that we can keep our sewer capacity ahead of our development as is required. And if Peter Johnson Stop may have a few more comments. Thank you, Sue. Yeah, I would just add that uh, the Water Quality Management Committee is working with our wastewater superintendent and DPW director on the next update to our comprehensive wastewater management plan. Um, but constructing, adding to sewer capacity is a, it's a multi-year process and um, looking at the cost, we're, you know, we're probably looking at several years down the road for the next extension on the sewer system. And uh, final point that I would add is our challenge is discharge. So it's, money is always an issue, but uh, a greater challenge right now, we have a, we have a wastewater treatment plant that can actually handle a lot more capacity without, uh, without too much difficulty. There, you know, would be some added equipment and added cost. But the real challenge is finding a place to put the discharge because with that discharge comes nitrogen and when you add too much nitrogen to a watershed, it gets back to the problem that we're trying to solve. So that's really the big challenge we have. The good news is we have great staff and committee working on it um, and not just with sewers but with alternative strategies as well. So uh, it's not an easy quick fix but it is something that's being worked on. You know, I, thanks. I think that that's very helpful. Um, we did include in the housing plan a number of efforts and studies that the, the planning board has been involved with um, in looking at places uh, for increased density. Does anybody on the planning board want to say something about that? Yes. Uh, we have two areas. One, we're working on an, an overlay district right now for multifamily housing. One of the things that we have is to increase housing uh, we're having a hard time in this town. Developers are having a hard time sometimes getting five acres, I mean, uh, five units per acre. Uh, this guideline and some others say it should be between eight and 10, and some as high as 15 if you really want to create uh, additional housing. And so we've identified within the Davis Strait study, that's where we're going to start off. We could actually have an overlay district within that first and increase that at a higher level. Uh, we've been working on, on developing that, hope to bring that to town meeting first. But then the other thing that we learned that I saw tonight, we probably should go back to uh, the Cape Cod Commission and see if they can tweak our study a little bit and see if there's uh, we could get started even faster on it with, uh, was it the 40R yeah. part? I mean, I think there's certain areas of the Davis Strait study would be perfect for that. Yeah. And uh, that's been published and out there for a while, and we probably sh should go back and push the housing a little harder on those areas. Thank you. That's, that's terrific. And I can mention that Bill Rayo um, from DHCD, who's kind of in charge of, of uh, 40R and the Starter Home Program, is always happy to go out to communities and make presentations. And if I could just make a plug for another meeting, because I know we love coming to meetings. Mm -hmm. October 23rd planning board meeting, Union Square will be back okay. with their presentation on uh, what they consider the missing middle. This is one of the slides we talked about. What's that density that transitions from 
uh, uh, larger structures into Klamath proper because you want to do housing, particularly multifamily housing, in a large scale redevelopment in context. So this is the project we've been working on with the Cape Cod Commission. Union Square will be back uh, Monday or Tuesday, October 23rd, uh, with the second presentation for uh, this and uh, two of the staff members uh, here in town, myself and Assistant Town Planner Corey Pacheco, will be at the SNEPA conference Thursday and Friday to actually present on a panel to talk about some of that work that we're doing. Terrific. So we're, we've got some tools, uh, we're making some progress. Uh, stay That's tuned. terrific, yeah, they're, they're really, um, they're right front. Good evening, folks. Uh, my name is Scott Zielinski. I'm a lifelong resident. Uh, I'm a small farmer, um, and it's come to our attention uh, in the farming community that there, there's a lift permit that's getting ready to cut one of our biggest contiguous pieces of AGA property uh, off a of locust field um, in half. Uh, while I understand I'm a past zoning board member. I recognize some of my fellow colleagues over there. They do a good job. Um, I just implore the people that are going to make this decision to um, remember, you know, what we are as a community. We started off as a farming community. I understand that there is a serious need for affordable housing. You spoke of the Wealthy Project. I, these hands, ran the excavator to dig those units th in 2001. So I, I understand that. I've seen a lot of programs, but I implore you to save our agricultural property. I mean, take that into consideration um, when, when you make your decisions. That's going to affect the, the character, which is what brings people here, including the people that you speak of that want to come move here, spend the money to live here. You know, it, once it's gone, it's gone. And I know that's a cliche. That's what I, I went in the Navy. I've been a, I grew up on a farm here. I went in the Navy. I came back. I'm on a farm here. There's a lot of little small farmers that don't have a voice in this. You know, the, the, this, this pro, these projects get clumped, to clumped through. Downtown. People say, oh, it's going to go yeah. through anyway. Oh. So there's no opposition. We don't have a voice. We've been to the, the, the Agricultural Committee to ask. That, and, and, and I'm not going to do a windmill thing and start a big ruckus. I just want the powers to be to be responsible and take the small farmers into consideration when they make their decisions. Thank you for your time, sir. Thank you. Anybody else? Go ahead. Nope. Actually, if you, if you want to use this mic right here. Grant Walker, uh, 71 Philadelphia Street. Would it be okay if I asked the previous speaker what he meant by uh, the agricultural land being cut? I didn't understand that. Is that all right if I? If you look at the map, if you look at the, the ag map uh, for Locust Field Road, that area, and you see this new lip application, if you draw a line on the lot, it's a four acre lot that goes right up through a kidney shape. Contiguous property that's zoned AGA. Okay, what that'll do in my past experience, and, and it, it'll set a precedence for over there. I know neighbors that I've talked to are ready to sell their property because it's going to change. And I and I and I know I don't want to get any tomatoes thrown at me because it's not in my backyard. But when the AGA stuff is gone, it is gone. Jeff Andrews tried to hold that farm together over there as long as he could, and he had to get rid of it. You know what I'm saying? So if you look, go and go and look at the zoning map and draw a, 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 a magic marker where this lip application is getting ready to go, it almost splits it directly in half. It's one of the last big pieces of contiguous AGA we have. Does that help you? Yeah. Hey, thank you very much. Thank you. Good question. Yes. Uh, Jerry Patamas. Um, here as an individual, I guess I want to speak to a couple of things of you have to be careful of the fringes uh, and we're looking towards the small a, a market rate affordability and the importance of the accessory apartment bylaw. But it has one big hindrance. It's the only bylaw that's going to require 
for affordable units that want to add one bedroom that's point oh one four five kilograms to spend twenty to thirty thousand dollars to meet an advanced nitrogen requirement of which there is no definition in the state or in the town of which the uh, water health has no enforcement policy uh, i think it's discriminatory is a wrong word but if we're trying to promote diversity in housing across the entire town this impacts those people that want to have small uh, small a affordable units in coastal low coastal overlay districts which are very attractive to folks and are very sensitive to nitrogen but why require twenty to thirty thousand dollars for one extra bedroom that's going to cost that's going to cost twenty to thirty thousand for point zero one four kilograms no one else in that overlay district that can go from four to six bedroom and not have to do any advanced nitrogen uh, we can discuss this more on town meeting floor where it sh it should be discussed and water quality committee and everybody else said they'll have a definition of advanced or what is appropriate for all the coastal overlays in a year but in the meantime we're putting a burden on the younger homeowners those homeowners that want to age in place by this added d night for coastal overlay districts i had uh, one other thing i think you should look at i think it's more than one percent of the town that's being sewered in in uh, with little pond sewer uh, i think your first note says it's one percent i think it's probably closer to three three to six percent i'll have the wastewater superintendent look that up that might be something of administrivia and i think on your slide uh it was limited but the one that talked about 80 percent capacity it really should say planning needs to begin when you hit 80 percent. that's right that's right that, that's uh, uh i think better discussed in the plan but yeah. wasn't so well articulated on on this thank you very much anybody else with any questions or comments or suggestions Paul Dreyer, Planning Board. I just have a practical question. On your slide talking about the challenges, you talk about zoning being ineffective. Would you enlarge upon that, particularly in light of the slides further on, where you come up with some very good ideas on what might be implemented in zoning? Well, why is it I, ineffective? Well, not all zoning is not ineffective. What I'm saying is that based on certain bylaws related to affordable housing or smart growth, those bylaws have not been particularly effective in creating uh, affordable units or incentivizing them. I mean, an example is the um, in the general residence district, you have an inclusionary zoning piece that you allow you allow someone to build a triplex, actually a three-unit development if one is affordable, but nothing's really come of it. And the question is, is there a way of you know reforming zoning to better? Uh, incentivize and but still mandate some inclusion of affordable housing I mean there are a couple of other examples that we provide where the bylaw really hasn't um, created uh, much permitting um, at all and so in those cases does it make sense to tweak um, or just kind of start with a, a new bylaw based on some uh, some you know other models is that Okay, I, I was talking just specifically on affordable housing units. Yeah. Yeah. I was just wondering in hearing Jerry's comments whether or not. I was just wondering in hearing Jerry's comment whether or not we should be using some of the funds we have as an incentive to get some affordable housing. For instance, in that scenario where someone has to spend twenty thousand dollars to upgrade their septic system in order to meet the. Uh, the requirement whether or not they could go to the uh, farm with affordable housing fund and ask for twenty thousand dollars in exchange for that unit becoming affordable which could be up to a hundred percent so there's a, a possible way to solve a problem like that that we would get an affordable unit 
for $20,000, which is really low compared to what it cost us to provide a gap financing for other type of units. So and chances, yeah, chances are that unit would not be eligible for inclusion on the subsidized housing inventory. That, that's but okay, it's but it still helps us. Yeah, you well, know. yeah, I mean, it's uh, uh, certainly creative ways of promoting and financing units should, can be explored. Yeah. Anybody else? What's the timeline for all this? Um, well, I think there was a real interest in moving this uh, forward fr uh, fairly quickly. So um, based on comments, you know, I'll probably be able to compile and finalize a draft within the next week or so. And then we're going to have to schedule meetings with the planning board and the board of selectmen. Uh, both have to approve them. So as quickly as we can get uh, those approvals, the better we can submit the plan to the state. Conversations have already begun between the AD, um, between the Affordable Housing Committee and the Planning Board to have a, another joint meeting at the end of November when the housing production plan can be discussed and hopefully approved. So uh, both groups are uh, working quickly to move that forward. Great. Thank you very much. I applaud your efforts, and I continue to be amazed at the collaboration that goes on in our town between the different groups and organizations. It really is a wonderful place to live and to work in. Um, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm Michael Kasperian. I'm president of the Falmouth Chamber of Commerce. So a couple of things stick out to me. Uh, first house I bought was a two-family house, which was an, a wonderful thing. Enabled me to buy a house right out of college. Enabled my wife to stay home for eight years with the kids. And so I'd like to see a lot more of that. And I've always been amazed how there really isn't any multifamily mm -hmm. building going on here. I think, you know, where I grew up in Providence, they were all two family or three family going up, but the duplex I think works. And the other thing I'd like to reiterate is uh, what Michael Galasso brought up. Our primary concern really is the seasonal workers because mm -hmm. what I'm seeing at the chamber, so many people that come in, we love this town so much, we decided to move here. What I've seen more and more people on town meeting floor being folks who have retired here, and I think what we're turning into is a very high-priced retirement community, and that's problematic. I also appreciate your comments, Mr. Zielinski. I think the agricultural community is often overlooked, and I think a lot of folks are sensitive to what, what you have to say. Um, but the other, the other group is the tourism industry. You know, our, our hotel rooms continue to decrease, and tourism probably is not as important economically as it once was, the year-round community, I think, has more of the trades and all, but I think what we're gonna see is that tourism industry shrink and shrink if we don't find housing for those seasonal employees. And I wonder if something creative could be done, such as perhaps the scientific community that's looking for housing, or the homeless community, um, some such groups as belonging to each other, looking for housing for folks in the winter if housing could be built, it could be used for seasonal employees in the summer, in either students ah, slash folks who, yeah. who need some temporary winter housing, and if there could be some type of a collaboration between town with available property and then, you know, public-private partnership. So I think, um, yeah. again, I applaud what you're doing. I think we have to be very creative. Right. I think time is running out. I think very quickly this could turn into an incredibly high priced retirement community where really that's going to be it and workers aren't going to be able to live here and it's going to be really problematic yeah. long term as right. our population ages. So right. thank you for your time. I love the idea of the, the seasonal workers and then people, you know, in, in homeless in the winter and that type of thing. I think that that's kind of magic. I also am a huge fan. We did include the two family house. Uh, as part of that strategy to allow more ha diverse housing types in more areas of town. I think that the owner-occupied two-family house is the most affordable because the owners can be le have less income because they're getting the rental income that counts towards underwriting. Absolutely. And then you're creating a new um, a rental unit as well. So, I mean, there's, there's a reason why they were, you know, such a major component of workforce housing in cities before zoning basically said you can't 
create these units anymore. So I, I really echo your interest in the two-family house. Hi, Jessica O'Brien. I echo that too, Michael, um, with, the, with the duplexes. I, I have a lot of friends who have lived in the area. I've graduated from Falmouth High School. Um, and a lot of friends who have moved off Cape to places like New Bedford, Providence, to buy those types of homes that are affordable, that they can live in, and they can have people help pay their mortgage by paying an affordable rent as well. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Our um, housing, uh, Pam Harding Barrett, I'm a dual citizen of both the <laughs> affordable housing and the planning board. Um, at the Housing Institute, it, New England is very unique, very parochial, very um, much. My daughter was in the Peace Corps, came back from Africa and said, you know what New England reminds me of? Little tiny fiefdoms where you have borders around each community that is impenetrable. And until we start thinking outside of the box of Falmouth, Mashpee, Bourne, and start looking at regional solutions, because we could form a regional solution to our housing much more quickly, I believe, than doing it each town by itself. And we look at regionalization of schools and we do regionalization of buying for buying power. But we don't look beyond that for anything else. Yeah. And I don't believe that there are not other communities. Oh, it's a double negative. I do believe that there are other communities that are in the same situation as we are um, that may just be willing to sit down and look at, let's cut through those primitive borders and start looking at other solutions where we can have much more housing, <coughs> workforce right. housing. It's not just Falmouth that is suffering from lack of work, you know, workforce housing. Right, and I gotta say there, uh, Lower Cape has actually made some progress on this where they have, you know, towns contributing CPA money to a project that's located in another one of their communities because they understand that their residents will benefit too. Pat Kerfoot, Planning Board. Pam said we have to look outside the box. Well, we've got one box that we're not going to be able to look out of, and that's the price of land. It just keeps going up. But the box we can look outside of is how we build whatever units we build. There are alternative construction me um, methods that are used all over the world, all over the country that I think we do need to be looking at. Instead of a stick bat built house right on the property, you have manufactured homes. I'm not talking about trailers. I'm talking about the ones that are built inside factories. They make more efficient use of their materials. You bring them on site, they're put up more efficiently. You can have them up in a day, a week, whatever it takes. Less expensive by far, and we are not doing that. Modular, prefab, panelized, yep. Anybody else? Yes. Ken Foreman, and uh, so I've served uh, both on the planning board and on the zoning board. Uh, and we've seen quite a few 40Bs, and the one sort of universal response, at least in terms of the feedback we get from abutters is that the density is very concerning. And so this sort of echoes in a way Scott's comments. Um, and I often wish we had a way to support uh, the developers to reduce density of if we're adding three market rate units for every affordable unit so that perhaps we could get closer to a 50% ratio or uh, even, you know, three affordable units for market rate units. This sort of a private-public partnership where we could use some of those CPA funds to, uh, you know, in, enhance the ability of developers to add affordable units without uh, having to go to such extremes in terms of the number of units crammed on a, 
on a site. Uh, you know, so just something, you, you know, you raised one point that I thought was, was pretty intriguing, which is the idea of tax relief for year-round rentals, for example. So I think we, if we're not willing to make a public expenditure to support uh, affordable housing, we're in trouble. We, need, we can't rely just on market forces and the 40B model to get to uh, this des you know, desired goal of 10%. But you, I mean, density is basically a subsidy. Correct. So if you don't have the density, then providing some additional subsidy to create affordability is something to look into. Um, and there would be the option in a new development to um, kind of buy down some of what would have been market units to convert them to affordability. Yeah. No, that's exactly what I'm what I'm advocating, and uh, I think should be uh, certainly emphasized in. If, if possible, in this production plan, and you know, s where we can have a friendly 40B, we have uh, you know the option to do uh, to do that you know even more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Anybody else? Thank you, Grant Walker. Again, in the uh, what are housing productions? Plans uh, part of the presentation. Uh, we read that Falmouth received a certification based on 2009 housing production. Uh, uh, so my question is, uh, has the Falmouth Zoning Board of Appeals ever exercised that to deny a 40B permit because it wasn't appropriate or whatever? So I, I, I think I can address that question. The, in order to uh, exercise the so-called safe harbor provision, which would allow the town to deny a 40B application, having a certified housing production plan is one of the pillars that you need, but you also need to meet your annual subsidized housing production goal, and I do not believe that Falmouth has ever been in that position. They did get one year. Or, sorry, so there was okay. Yeah. So there was one year, yeah. and obviously before my time. So I don't know <laughs> if, if during that one year, any of the uh, 40B applications were able yeah. to be denied. Yeah. But current, just to, if I if I might just add on to that, currently we do not have a certified housing production plan. No, you don't even have an approved plan to get to a certified plan. Yeah, I think the one year was uh, Ed Curley. Um, was when Atria opened, and that uh, about way above the 72 units or whatever it was, mm -hmm. 2009, 10, 2009 was yeah right. <coughs> Thank you. That's helpful. All right. A couple more questions. If anybody had any comments, right? You again, <laughs> please. I can't find the place where I saw this, but uh, somewhere in the presentation, it actually has uh, a statement like, um, we could put perhaps some residential units, housing units in the uh, Falmouth Mall area. Mm -hmm. So my question is what, is, what do you mean by the Falmouth Mall area? And secondly, uh, how, does the plaza, the, I guess. how does the uh, owner of the Falmouth Mall think about that or feel about that? Is that something that the owner is interested in? Well, this plan hasn't gotten into the nitty gritty of implementation. It just gives examples of how other communities have integrated housing into their kind of shopping commercial areas um, and suggests that the town explore some of those approaches. Um, but there, it's, it, it's the, we're, we're on a conceptual format uh, plane right now, not into the actual uh, discussions with uh, with the developer. Well, just a follow up. Does a conceptual plan include housing right on the Falmouth Mall property, or does it? Do you mean near that property when you say the Falmouth Mall area? You really need to. Uh, 
take a look at the Davis Straits plan, okay? And take a look at the areas that they've called in that. And the Falmouth, I think we're confusing Mall and Plaza. There's a couple different things here on terminology. But I want to focus as far as what the town's been working on. You need to look at the Davis Straits plan, and it actually has layouts of green areas where greater dense would be. And the next step that we're dealing with is we want, we'd like to integrate uh, not just guidelines on how to build these properties, but form-based code is another whole step we want to take. But Grant, if you spend some time in looking at the Davis Straits plan and look at the Falmouth Mall area and the Falmouth Plaza and see what's identified for it, you'll get an understanding of what we're trying to talk about. But that that would clear that up. But the really next step for us is to integrate uh, form-based code I into which deals on the shape and size of the buildings and how they integrate with the streets and uh, and not just on not just separating property but uses. But the area we're specifically talking about is the Davis Straits redevelopment site. It goes from Scranton Avenue all the way up to uh, up into T-Ticket and it covers the Falmouth Mall, all, all that area. It's a 50-year plan and it's not gonna be happening tomorrow, but we've gotta start someplace. And what we're trying to bring forward is the, uh, you know, the multifamily housing district right away and put some incentives in the development so the developers that own these big box, one of the things we're seeing right. is big boxes going away for shopping and people are doing, you know, by mail and delivery. We're seeing trends around the whole country that malls have been converted into housing. Right. It's a national trend that is happening. We do allow zoning in our B2 district, but we only allow six units per acre. In order for it to really to get housing, it should be at least eight or not, or, or 10. So we're gonna, our, our, every week, every time we meet, um, the multifamily housing district is on our agenda. And we try to, we try to bring it up lo lots of times, and we need to bring that forward and create a district first that will establish what we want. Do we want to have 10 units per acre? 12, six, whatever we want, we decide as a town, we create that unit, and then we start assigning it to different areas. As soon as we create it, the first thing the planning board will do, we look to go to the Falmouth Plaza, which is the, earlier than the mall, but the same type big box store type operation, and try to incentivize the owners there that they could get twice the rent if they rebuilt and put apartment did mixed use. And that's what we're talking about. That's what the planning board's talking about. And our plans are identified specific by area in the David Strait study, and you should familiarize yourself with that. May I follow that up? That's great. One of the, one of the hurdles we face is the term uh, units per acre. Oh, I'm Bob Lear from the planning board. Uh, one of the hurdles we face is the number of units per acre. And it's kind of deceiving because people think uh, eight units per acre, wow, that's a lot of houses. And they, they typically look at it in terms of what you would see in a, in a development. And we're looking at a, a, a different term, and I can never remember it, uh, but it's a different uh, way of terming that. And the example I use all the time is uh, Odd Fellows Hall. That converts to 20 units per acre, that one building. So it's a concept that we have to uh, change and wrap our heads around so that we're not just talking about eight units per acre, six units per acre. So that's something that's in the works. Well, and the whole idea of visualizing density with uh, visual representations from the Union Studio really makes sense because you know what you think of as high density by numbers uh, and then you look at some options, good design takes you a long way in an appropriate setting. You bring up the word design, and um, you know, we've had problems in this community with a poorly designed and executed 40Bs and other projects, and I'm just wondering, where do we come up with some design guidelines for projects that we wanna see in our community versus just taking anything that's proposed by a developer? I think the planning board is trying to do some of that as part of their, you know, looking at multifamily and, and mixed use development. But there are clearly great design guidelines in other, you know, comparable communities that you can, um, you know, look at. And in the case of a uh, friendly 40B, you can really negotiate a lot on uh, design um, work. Anybody else want to add anything about about that? If I could actually just draw you out a little bit on that. So 
understood with friendly 40 B's, the town has a little bit more ability to negotiate desirable design elements. But in a traditional 40 B, you know, I, there's some frustration right now with the uh, Liberty Green proposal. Um, and the town's ability to prevent that is really, I mean, I would, I would defer to you to respond to that question. Outside of the safe harbor, if you could uh, describe what, um, what ability the town has to influence that. Well, you know, some communities have developed what they call LIP uh, program guidelines, where they lay out, you know, these are the locations, these are the densities in these locations, these are the uh, preferred, you know, design prototypes that we would like to see. And it's, so it's all laid out. So developer wants to come into the community and do some development and wants to go through the friendly option. It has a certain sense on what the, you know, the community concerns and priorities will be. So I highly recommend that the town kind of look, look into that. And CPA funds would be an eligible, this would be an eligible activity under CPA. Thank you. Anything else? You guys, I mean, really terrific questions and comments, and uh, we'll be making some changes uh, to the existing plan, and we'll be, you know, noting these comments in the uh, housing production plan, and. Um, you know, stay tuned and hopefully we'll have an improved plan within the next uh, few weeks. Anything else you want to add? Go ahead. This has to do again with thinking outside of our box when you mentioned zoning and how ineffective it's been. We may, and I think we will have to, to get the kinds of density we're looking at so that we can reduce the cost of housing to increase our height limits. Mm -hmm. I don't know to what, and I don't know how you do it without it being obnoxious, but it can be done. You know, once again, I think that some of the work that Union Studio is doing should look at that, uh, particularly with the context of any zoning for uh, Davis Straits. Um, good comment. Anybody else? <laughs> May I ask one more question about that Davis Straits plan? <laughs> um, sure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> does that plan? Uh, at, actually, at your recommendation recently, I, I did take a look at that plan. It's a very impressive plan, and um, it requires, for me anyway, multiple readings, you know, to really uh, pick it all up, to be honest with you. Uh, but it's been a couple of months, actually, since I read some guidelines from the Massachusetts Housing and Urban Development. I just wonder if they come into play in this regard. Uh, among the guidelines for uh, state funding from housing and urban development for affordable housing projects is the criterion that uh, they should um, demonstrate um, tangible, uh, what shall I call it, sustainability in terms of energy efficiency and renewable energy. Good point, yes. And, and uh, so my question is this point, does the Davis Strait plan have any of that? In my first couple of reads through it, I didn't see it, but as I said, it's a very comprehensive and detailed plan. I know I could have missed it. We haven't dealt with any building codes or energy efficiency. We're way, you know, that's it's premature. Yeah, we've got a long way to go. Those yeah. are great ideas. They, they are, yeah. <coughs> Thank okay, you for mentioning. Everyone, I, I want to thank you all for coming. That concludes our program this evening. And as uh, you've heard tonight, this is going to take a lot of uh, public-private partnership and all of us working together as we have in the past uh, to create affordable housing. Thank you very much for coming tonight and participating in this event. Thank you too much.